week on Quality Digest Live, we wonder what Henry Ford would think of cap and trade in today's California. Mm -hmm. Plus, want to go lean? We'll give you a quick seven point checklist to do just that when we come back. Well, welcome back to Quality Digest Live for January 4th, 2013. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest publisher Mike Richmond. Dirk, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you, buddy. Hope and you uh, the break. by the way, you all may notice that we're sitting a little higher today. Uh, there's a reason for that. Yes. Uh, Mike and I ate a little bit too much over the holidays. We came in, sat down in our director's chairs, and they promptly split. No, that's not what happened. Yours <laughs> too much promptly mashed split. <laughs> too much mashed potatoes. Yours man. split. Mine was fine, but you're already a little taller than me. So if you were up here and I was, that yeah. would have been that would have been like Mutton Jeff, Tom all right. or something like that. Yeah, I'm gonna anyway. eat less. Right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay. Well, happy New Year to you, all of you as well. Hope you had a great holiday season, and we're we're back at you here in 2013. Okay. Yep. First up this week and in the year is an insightful piece from the University of Buffalo School of Management. In a recent study, the school revealed that managers who take steps to reduce cynicism in their organizations can help lead to better employee engagement. The research looked at specific organizations in which cynicism is frequently rampant, state prisons. State prisons. Now, cynicism there? Cynicism in prisons. Who would have thought, right? I mean, I mean it makes sense. Prison employees now, of course, face some very tough cultural challenges, and that creates real issues with commitment. In fact, Past research cited by Dr. Paul Tesluk, the author of the study, indicates that this environment sees a 50% turnover wow. in the first year of service for employees and a 38% turnover for the industry as a whole. So half the people who start quit within the first year or are fired, laid off, right. whatever, yeah. and almost and more than a third at some point get turned over. So right. that's a huge amount yeah. of turnover for well, that Well, it's a industry. pretty depressing environment. You know? it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough <laughs> yeah. environment, yeah. sure. It's a tough environment, and that, that's what he's talking about, uh, that this particular environment was selected because it was the, an extreme example of, of how cynicism can be rampant in an okay, organization. Okay. Gotcha. And the lessons that were learned from the study uh, are really are applicable to any organization. And uh, they specifically include backing words with actions. In other words, it makes sense, the, the managers have to do what they say they're going to do. They can't, right. You can't just say you're going to do something and then not do it. If you're going to take, take uh, the lead in, in, doing, in saying you're going to do something with your employees, you better do it. Or if you don't, they're going to get pretty dis disenfranchised and right. disenchanted. Asking for and acting on employee feedback. So not just asking for it, not just listening to it, but acting on it. Doing what those employees say would be better uh, to, to, to improve their work environment. Okay, and th this is something that they did both. They, they, uh, prisons that did have these in place and didn't have these in place? Right, or, okay. right. This okay. is, this, these are steps that they determined were the differentiators okay. between, between systems that had better employee engagement and worse. Okay. And finally, providing ways for the rank and file to participate in organizational change initiatives. And you know, this all makes sense, right? I mean, if you think about it, you, you, you can't fake it, right? You can't fake it. If you're a manager and you want better engagement in your, in your work, workforce, and it doesn't matter if it's a prison, doesn't matter right, if you're right. software, fab, whatever it is, uh, if you want better engagement, you've, you've got to kind of walk the talk. You can't just say you're going to do something and then not do it. You've got to believe in it. And you've got to trust your employees. You've got to be able to say that, that they are the ones that are at the front lines and they're the ones that really know how their work needs to be better. And you can't have this top down thing. We talk about it all the time. Right, you right. can't have this top down thing where you're going to say, well, I know best. I'm the manager. What you say doesn't really count, or just give lip service to it and say, "Yeah, I want to hear what your thoughts on this," and then never act on it. Right? Because employees are going to see right through that. Yeah, so, yeah. if if you want to have an engaged workforce and you want to damp down cynicism, and, and let's be honest, I mean, cynicism kills organizations. Right, sure. I mean, it's it's a quiet killer because you're not going to many times if somebody's really cynical. You may get the little subtle hints of it in some comments, but really they're going to probably keep it to themselves, kind of. And they're just either they're going to quit or they're not going to do good work or you're going to fire them, lay them off, whatever it is. So right. this, I think, are good lessons. The article uh, is right below the player page. All the stories we're going to cover on today's show, again, right. as we always do, 
are right below the player page right there. So read it, check that one out. I'll link over to the, the study because it's a good study from, from the University of, uh, of Buffalo the School of, of Management. And uh, find out a little bit about how cynicism can affect your, uh, your organization, how you okay. can prevent that. Well, from management to, uh, to lean, uh, in an article this week by Matthew May uh, titled uh, Seven Targets for Lean Innovation, May reacquaints us with the seven wastes that were, many of you know, were made popular by the Toyota production system. May points out that while these may have originated in a production environment, they are equally important in any kind of environment. And I thought it would be kind of good to run through, uh, run through these seven wastes and talk about them. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with them, but even if you are, it doesn't hurt to kind of go through it and think about maybe how they apply to your organization. So just really quickly, uh, and I'll, I'll go back and touch on them a little bit more. The seven wastes, and these kind of are titled differently depending on, on who's giving them, but they're all basically the same. I mean, basically, no matter what they're called, the seven ways are basically cover the same thing. So uh, overproduction, overprocessing, conveyance, inventory, motion, defects uh, slash rework, and waiting or wait time. So let's, let's kind of go through these real quick and, and look at some of the things that, uh, that uh, Matthew May points out on these. So let's take a look at the, force, the first one, which is overproduction. Basically what we're talking about here is anything done without regard to the demand counts as overproduction. Uh, overproduction. So you may be producing more product than you really need. Mm -hmm. This includes something as simple as processing an order before it's actually needed. And uh, May says, you know, overprocessing or inappropriate processing when there are too many non-value added steps to achieve a given, un uh, given outcome, if you do that, you've got overprocessing. And examples might include uh, too many operations to complete a, a phase of work or the effort needed to inspect and fix defects arising from poor tool or product design and maybe a redundant data entry due to a lack of integration between multiple systems. It's a common one. It's a real common one. Mm -hmm. and, and one that he gives that is a as an example of somebody who's kind of banished this particular waste or overproduction is Amazon. Uh, Amazon is a lean company and it banished overprocessing with its one click innovation. If you've ever used Amazon, you know that's exactly how it works. One click and your order is processed. Mm -hmm. Now the next waste is conveyance or transporting. Uh, transporting a product between processes, that adds cost to the product. And, and transportation can be difficult to reduce due to the perceived cost of maybe moving equipment and processes closer together. So you, you know, people think, well, if I'm, if I'm going to rearrange my production line, I'm going to get things closer together in order to reduce the, the transport costs, well, that's going to cost me a lot of time and money just to make that change over in my environment. Um, and the other part of that is sometimes it's hard to decide which process, processes should be next to each other, but May uh, still concludes that conveyance is still, or transport is still a necessary evil to be reduced wherever possible. Uh, he also points out this is one of the reasons that the Postal Service is in decline because technology is helping us to do just that. We right. don't need to send necessarily snail mail, paper mail. There's so many other methods to use now, or even more efficient methods of sending uh, paper mail, you know, the, the transport services like UPS or FedEx or so forth. Sure, so. or I mean, you don't even need to say print and ship a magazine. You can, you can you convey can, information you, through the internet and exactly. live and that, streaming video. This is exactly, yeah. it, it's, it's that reduction, that reduction, that particular type of waste that is uh, making the Postal Service uh, really sweat. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, another waste is inventory or excess inventory. Uh, that's the result of overproduction and waiting, other wastes. Uh, it increases lead times, consumes productive floor space, and it also delays the identification of problems. Yeah, sure. uh, you, if you've got excess inventory, you don't necessarily know you have a problem until you start to ship, and now you've got all this excess inventory with, uh, uh, you know, with problems in them that you then have to deal with. So May points out uh, that uh, an idea of excess inventory is your average visit to a car dealership. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us know that that's a pretty painful experience. Can be. Yeah, unless you like to bargain, in which case it's pretty fun. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on your perspective, sure. Uh, but his point is that the buildup of cars 
in a dealership is really what is at the root cause of sales pressure and unfriendly consumer tactics. You've got to move those cars, got to move those vehicles. Right? You know, it's also somewhat of an accounting thing because, well, sure. because inventory in, in, in a certain way can be looked at as a, as a positive thing or it can be looked at as a negative thing. Is it, is it, is it, uh, is it which side of the balance sheet really is it on? Right. It, it, you know, and, and I think that a lot of times when you go to a lean operating principles, when you go to lean operations, you, the accounting system needs to keep up with that because you know you, you don't want to have your your inventory be considered an asset. You know, and right, right, right. If you consider your inventory yeah. as, an, as an asset, there's going to be a lot of reluctance to move to a lean system, and it's really right. not an asset. It's not an asset. No, exactly, and that's been pointed out several times. It, it right. can be looked at yeah. as an asset, yeah. but it's really not an yeah. asset. Um, uh, another waste is excess motion. Um, while you might have the leanest process in the market, needless repetition of that process just really sucks up time and productivity and, and cost. Even Amazon, for instance, with its aforementioned one-click process, struggles with this, uh, struggles with this problem. And, and May points out you cannot, for example, buy more than a single Kindle edition, a Kindle book at a time. Last year, a large tech company wishing to buy 500 copies of the ebook version of uh, Guy Kawasaki's best-selling Enchantment tried Apple's iTunes first. Apple told the company to buy 500 gift cards, scratch off the back, and then enter individual <laughs> gift codes one at a time into iTunes. By the way, that same problem also exists with Amazon. You can't order up, you can't go in and make, uh, you know, uh, order several different books at a time and then use one click to get to them. It's one book at a, at time. a time, and that's, that's waste. That's sure, yep. absolutely. Um, getting down to the end of here, defects and rework is another waste. That one seems pretty obvious. We've all experienced a defect of some kind, errors or inaccurate or incomplete information, flawed products. It's important to reduce the probability that things don't work uh, the way they should. Uh, surprisingly, says May, reducing defects is often not even a priority, even in life-critical experiences like medical care. Uh, a, 2020, a 2010 survey from the Department of Health and Human Services found that about one in every seven Medicare patients in hospitals suffers a serious medical mistake, contributing to the deaths of an estimated 180,000 patients a year. Of those, 180,000, roughly 80,000 were caused by errors that could be caught and prevented with the simplest of methods, such as a, a standardized checklist like those uh, used by every airline pilot. In fact, this was been written about already, and you, many of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, surgeon and author Atul Gawande pointed this out, the idea of using a checklist in his book, uh, The Checklist Manifesto. Right. So waiting is another waste, whether it's an endless unmoving queue, being stuck in idle while you wait for an approval to proceed, or simply a slow connection speed. We've all experienced waiting, says May, uh, along with the accompanying sense of helplessness and lost productivity. But something can be done about it. May points to both um, Minute Clinic and Wellness Mart MD, which are, these are, uh, these are kind of in and out uh, clinics, right. but the reason they're in and out and why they're for fa so fast is um, they have gotten rid of the dreaded waiting room. And the way, the way they do that is they simply minimize the procedures uh, that they handle. Um, and by doing that, by minimizing the type of procedures they handle, and they, they've got just a, a small list of things, mm -hmm. kind of common things, you know, common ailments, mm -hmm. cold, cold, sore throat, that sure. sort of stuff, mm -hmm. not handling the other things, you can get in and out of these places very quickly because you don't have, you're not waiting for somebody who has a more serious condition right. to be checked out while you're waiting just to have you know, a, a sore throat, throat yeah, looked at, sure, right? right? So it makes, it makes a lot of sense. So kind of, um, uh, there's, there's a great quote in this article from, uh, from Matthew May, if we, can, if we can put that up. He says, lean innovation isn't about doing more with less. It's about doing better with less. Here, here. And I think that is really interesting. A lot of times we think we, you know, the idea of doing more with less, sometimes it makes sense, but a lot of times, it, really what you're talking about is, can I do what I'm already doing better? Can I be more efficient at it? Mm -hmm. I don't have to do more, I just need to be more efficient. Right. And that's actually going to translate, in many cases, to more in any case. It's going to increase your productivity. So. Yeah, and lean, lean is a big buzzword now. Of course, a lot of people are talking about lean, but, but there, there, there's good ways to do lean and there's bad ways to do lean. And I think that, that, that what Matthew May is talking about here is a good way to do lean. Right. And his quote right there, really, that you want to you just do things better. You want to do them better. You, know, right? you don't want to do necessarily more with less or yeah. even less with more. Well, you want his point is, you, you can, there's a limit to how much 
more you can do. There is no limit right. to how much better yeah. you can get. You can always get better. That's true. But more has constraints. There's always physical constraints there, there, or time there, constraints. There's yeah. always, always yeah. constraints to that. Great, yeah. great. And actually, that leads in very nicely, as it, as it happens, to the article that I want oh. to cover this week because we're also going to talk about lean and we're going to talk about, about how to, in a, in a little different sense, about, about what constraints are and, and, and what you can do with lean to improve a certain situation. In this case, we're going to be talking about uh, Bill Levinson's story, Henry Ford would dump California. <laughs> Would Henry Ford dump California? <laughs> well, Levinson said he would. <laughs> he would. He would certainly dump on California. I don't, but I think would he would he dump California altogether? I don't know. He, but we're going to find out by diving into the story. Now, only right. Bill Levinson, only our friend Bill Levinson, could possibly combine Henry Ford and Cap and Trade and Cap and Trade and James <laughs> Womack and Rudyard Kipling's poem, "The Gods of of Copybook Copy Headings. Headings." The Gods of Copybook Headings, which is an interesting poem. Dirk understands it. <laughs> it is an interesting poem. <laughs> but essentially, what the poem is talking about, the, the motif he's talking about here is, is, is common sense versus, right. ver, you know. Versus market, the market. Versus yeah. the market. And, and market forces push you in a certain way, and maybe common sense pushes you in another way. And he's talking about this, of course, within the framework of, of cap and trade and, and emissions, uh, emissions regulations and, and ultimately climate change, too. Um, what he's saying here is that is that cap and trade emissions do really don't reduce emissions. Cap and trade standards, these regulations, really don't reduce emissions. All it simply does is it just shifts them around. Ultimately, work manufacturing is going to go where it's cheapest to manufacture. And one of the key factors there is energy costs. And, sure. and in a place like China, for instance, it's a lot cheaper. There really isn't emission standards or not to the same degree that we have in other in America or in European countries where there's cap and trade increasingly uh, and there's there's carbon tax. There's a lot of right. different different ways to control emissions. Uh, and I think that and we're going to get into it here in a moment, but I think that there's positives and negatives to all of that sure. as well. And, yeah. and certainly Bill has a, a perspective on this. He does. Uh, as he always does, and everybody does. Yeah. You know, sure. I mean, yeah. a, a compelling article will always have a perspective, but I'm going to get to that in a moment. Now, this issue, this issue of emissions, uh, cap and trade, and carbon tax, has really become very much politicized. Uh, anything to do with to even touch on climate change at all is going to yeah. be going to be very, very well read by our readership. As a matter of fact, Dirk, you may not know this, you may not know this out here, but this article by Bill Levinson is the highest read article of 2013. <laughs> Oh really? It's, a, it's amazing. 2013. It's, it's the, it's All three the days most <laughs> well-read article we've had in the entire year of 2013. We've had a lot of people. Read. Actually, no. Yeah. In, 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 in the normal normal run of things, this has been a very very well-read article, yeah. uh, even compared to our 2012 article, <laughs> yeah. uh, because again, it, it touches yeah, on something that a lot of people really want to want to know about. And you know, slamming California is always involved. Hey, you know, I did it when I lived in Jersey, you know, we're Californians and we yeah. love California, but land of fruit and nuts. That's <laughs> But it's easy to I mean California yeah. has a lot of policies in place yeah. that a lot of the country look at and kind of scratch their heads about it. And, yeah. and this plan AB32, which is California's Global Warming Solutions Act actually, which is what Bill's talking about in the piece, was actually passed in 2006. Okay. Uh, and over the course of time, uh, the scoping plan identified, the scoping plan of AB32 identified cap and trade as the way they wanted to handle their emissions. This was an emissions act, uh, an, an emissions limiting act for California. and the enforceable compliance obligation began just a couple days ago at the start of 2013, okay. which again is why, why Bill's talking about it now. Now, cap and trade, of course, you know, caps, caps the limit of, of carbon that you can use, the emissions you can, you can have. And if you need to go over, you need to borrow them, essentially. There's from, auctions. From somebody from who's somebody underneath who's their limit. Underneath yeah, it. yeah, so yeah. It, it's kind of a shell game. That's kind of what, what Bill is saying yeah, here. Yeah, a lot of people have said. Yeah. Is that it, it's yeah. muda. It, it's yeah. just shifting it around. It's, it's over-processing, as, as Matthew May just kind of referred to. But I think that there's, there's more here going on. Than, than, than just that, than just this idea of, of Muda. Because again, there, there's a political component to this that I, I think you know, we, we can't really too much overlook here. Um, for instance, Bill talks about, uh, and I'm not an engineer, Bill's an engineer, but I'm not an engineer. Right. He talks about that there's a limit, say, to, to aluminum production, right? Aluminum requires a certain amount of energy to right. produce aluminum. And, and you know, aluminum is shipped all over, and bauxite is shipped from Australia to Scandinavia to produce it because it's, because, it's cheap, yep. cheaper to do it that way. But my point is, well, gosh, maybe we can get rid of aluminum altogether. I mean, maybe that's heresy to say it, but maybe there's ways to just eliminate that step, you know, rather than rework it and rework that in a way, maybe we should try to eliminate 
the problems. You know, that's one thing that HSBM right. is all about, hazardous substance process managers, is about getting rid of these components that are bad, right? As opposed to just working around them and having to dispose of them, right? right. Um, and again, what I think what's going on here is, is there's a perspective here, and I'm not criticizing Bill, I'm not criticizing anybody, I'm just, just stating what I'm seeing here. There's a perspective that, that emissions uh, kind of aren't that big of a deal because climate change doesn't exist, right? And, and, and I, think that's, that, I think that's kind of Bill's perspective, and, I think. And maybe yeah. not even Bill, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe somewhat Bill, I'm not criticizing okay. Bill, but I've certainly read others who have taken yeah. these similar attacks where it's like, don't worry about emissions, just do what's best for business, let the marketplace kind of determine it, yeah. right? And I think, to me, really what this comes down to is, is well, what makes the most sense? I mean, it, it, yeah, you can, you can ignore the climate change and climate right. emissions, you can say it doesn't matter, but what if it does matter? Are, right. are, isn't it better to assume that it does matter and take steps to address it rather than assuming it doesn't matter? Well, yeah, and I, I, think, I think Bill has actually an, another point that he's talked about is that um, uh, regardless of whether, regardless, and, and Bill has said this several times, regardless of whether you believe in climate change or not, it, carbon, carbon emissions are still, excess carbon emissions are still it's waste. waste right. So if, if, if it is possible to reduce your carbon emissions by right. being more efficient, it's just a good thing to do anyway, well, regardless of what your beliefs are, and, so it's just waste. And, <laughs> and it, it brings me to my final point I want to make on this, which is, which is I, I asked you about this earlier today, is, is Pascal's wager, if you knew right. of Pascal's okay. wager. And Blaise Pascal, 17th century uh, French scientist, philosopher, uh, his wager was that a rational man, in terms of belief in God or, or being agnostic or, be, or being uh, atheist, a rational man will wager that God exists because the benefits of that are so much greater. Sure. You know, right. why wager that God doesn't exist? Because if you're wrong, you're going to be really <laughs> sad you were wrong. And if you, if you were right and God, you know, God exists, hey, the benefits are great. Yeah. I think it's similar with climate change. I mean, the wager should be assume that climate change is happening. Whether you believe it or not, let's take the steps to assume it is happening and address that and get right. rid of the processes that are causing uh, emissions. And cap and trade, hey, maybe it's not the best. Maybe carbon tax is better, maybe it's worse, who knows. But yeah. something needs to be done, right? Right. And I think that we should take steps as if, car as if climate change is happening, because if we don't take steps and climate change is happening, we're gonna really regret it in a couple of decades. Right. And I think that's the, the takeaway that I had when I read this article. Yeah, and I think, and I, I think that's kind of, uh, as I mentioned, I think that's kind of Bill's point yeah. also as well, it's, it's just like, you know, it's kind of irrelevant what your political beliefs are. It's 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 waste. Yeah. You know, and, and Ford would be going. Wait a minute. You, you don't want stuff to go. You don't want money going up the smokestack. Sure. You know. I mean, if, if there's a way to reduce that that money going out the smokestack, then you want to do it. Right. For whatever reason, if if nothing else, then just the bottom line. Right. Yeah. Okay. So many of you uh, quality professionals out there are probably wondering. Well, you know, does quality really count anymore? Does anybody really care? And, and you know, I, and one way to, to, to look at, believe it or not, one way to look at the importance of quality and whether anybody still cares about quality is to turn to our friends at Google. And uh, this information was sent to me, or part of this information was sent to me by a, a, one of our upcoming columnists, Michael McLean in Australia. And he sent me to Google Trends. And he said, you know, uh, put, a couple, put a couple things in Google Trends. We'll do that right now if we go to our screen share here. I'm going to type Six Sigma into Google Trends. And if we do that, notice, now Google Trends maps the number of searches for a particular term over time. And in this case, it's from 2004 to, uh, to 2012. And we can see the searches on Six Sigma have decreased. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I went, I put in ISO 9001. And let's, let's look at that. And we put in ISO 9001, we see it's decreased a little bit, but basically stayed the same. And I said, well, how about quality management? I'll just type that in here right now. We'll type in quality management. And we look at that graph. And look at that, quality management has gone down. I'm going, holy mackerel, what's going on here? So let's just type in the word quality. I type in the word quality and the trend is still down and I put in statistical process control and the st trend was still going down. I put in Deming and the trend's going down. I put in, I put in uh, uh, Shuhart and the trend was going down. Did you put in Kim Kardashian? <laughs> I put in Lady Gaga. <laughs> that went up. That went up. <laughs> so what would I do? So who would have thought? Who so I'm thinking, well, what, is this, what does this mean? I mean, like you look at the trend, anything related to quality, I mean, metrology, I mean, it's going, everything you put in, it's going downhill. And like, what the heck? What's going on? Mm -hmm. I started thinking about this a little bit. It's like, well, 
what the heck are people search in, in quality professionals searching for if they're not searching about quality? And it came to me. So I put in a different word. I put in porn. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> That explains it all. That's Your where boss all says, says, Smithers, go out there and give me some information on total quality management. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know? You know? I think you've hit on something. I think I've hit on something. That's why. Did, did, you, did you type in quality porn? No, but I did type in this, and this was the amazing thing. And this is actually getting to something. I typed in Lean Six Sigma. Let's do that. Lean. <laughs> this is amazing. You're having way too much fun with this. This is amazing. <laughs> I typed in Lean Six Sigma. Look at that. There you go. There lean you go. Six Sigma. But so what does this mean? Think about it. Okay. Lean. If I was, if I was a, a Lean Six Sigma consultant, yes. you know what my sales pitch would be? Check out Google. Check out Google. No, I would say Lean Six Sigma. Good as porn. <laughs> <laughs> better. 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 Better than porn. <laughs> So if you're a Lean Six Sigma consultant out there, I'm telling you. There's your tagline. <laughs> there's your tagline. There's your tagline. Lean Six Sigma, at, at good as porn. Top of your website. <laughs> Everything wow. else is diving, but not lean. I don't wow. have no idea what any of that means, but it's from Google and it's on the internet, so it must be true. That's fascinating. Uh, fascinating. <laughs> I, I, thank you, Dirk. A little I, New that, Year's that's, silliness, that's, but. Uh, that's, that's good. That's but good those job. are real numbers, by those the way. Are, those are real numbers. I have, actually, I have some ideas of why you're seeing those trends down, and it actually has nothing to do with interest in. Six Sigma or no. quality or that, but we can get into that. And actually, we're going to have an article on that. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, from the same man, I believe, from Michael McLean, I believe he's going to write an article mm -hmm. on this trend uh, sometime. Uh, coming up. Coming up. Well, yeah. what, well, Dirk, since we're talking about that, what else do we have coming up? This year is going to be a great year for us. Yeah, we, we have a lot of new things coming up. We for do. those of you we who do. are regular follower of our live programs, either QDL or uh, Technorazzi mm -hmm. Live, we have a new live show that we'll be announcing in the next couple weeks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is going to be for all of you metrology people out there, measurement people out there. It is going to be a live half-hour show with Craig Howell, who is the uh, owner, president and owner of CPM Labs. It's a calibration lab in Sacramento, California. If you've ever watched our, our DVD series, Gauging Basics, you know who Craig is. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a live show where you can send in your questions for related to gauging, you know, how do I measure this, how do I measure that, or I have this gauging problem, how do I calibrate something, and we're going to answer them live on the show. Now, each show is going to have its own particular theme, mm -hmm. so each show is going to deal with some aspect of gauging, uh, maybe surface plate calibration, mm -hmm. you know, calibration of various instruments, but part of the show is going to be directly to answer your questions about how to gauge something, how to, some, uh, how to measure something, things like that. We'll answer them live on the air. Obviously, since it's a live show, you can also a uh, ask questions mm -hmm. uh, live during the show. But what we're looking for you right now is if you have an idea for something that you would like to see on mm -hmm. the Gauging Basics show, um, go ahead and email those to, um, uh, yeah, to QDL at Quality Digest. Dot com. Send us, you know, what do you want to see on this show? The show, we're, we're hoping, is going to start in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. We're still yep. working out the yep. details. Yep. What do you want us to see answer on the show? So send us your questions, send stumpers, anything you've got related to gauging. Craig Howell will answer them on the show. And um, we'll, be letting you know, we'll be letting you know more about that mm -hmm. in the coming weeks and exactly when the show is going to start. But we're hoping to start it in January. Yeah, so. Some good, good products and good solutions. So if, yeah. you're, if you're interested in, in uh, engaging, calibration, Metrology, this is going to be the place to, to check that out. Starting Absolutely. soon. And Dirk, we also have some really interesting articles coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, you have one that we were talking about right before the break about accreditation and, and some interesting. Yeah, uh, particularly if, uh, if, if you're in the, the medical device, if you're in the medical device uh, field, uh, manufacturer, you may or may not know this, um, but there is a standard out there, and doggone it, I forgot to write it down. I think it's 60601. 60, yeah, 60, 60, I think 60601. Should have written it down, sorry. Um, but one of the things that's been happening is there was an upgrade to it to revision three. And many registrars have been telling companies if they have the older, if they're accredited to the older version of 60601, that they have to renew their certification or they stand a chance of losing their CE mark. According to the European Commission, and many people who have complained, that is actually not true. And several registrars are being called on the carpet by 
the EC for actually requiring people to recertify because recertifying, if you're in this field, medical device certification, you know it is not cheap. It's mm -hmm. tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, for a large company, maybe not a big deal. If you're a small uh, medical device company, having to recertify all of your devices mm -hmm. uh, is not an inconsequential thing. And it turns out you probably or most likely don't have to. So you're going to want to read that article. It'll be coming up uh, next week, next Wednesday, I believe. So yep. if you're in the medical device market, uh, manufacturer, you'll want to read that article. Check that out. And we yep. also have a piece from Ryan Day. Our own Ryan Day is coming out with a piece on counterfeit components in the Department of Defense. Uh, yeah, this is, a big, no. this, this is a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's been going on for a while, but the government is really trying to get uh, a lot more serious about it. And that is very often, uh, as many of you know, a lot of the equipment um, that the military uses, mm -hmm. the aerospace uses, is stuff that was built 50 years ago, and it's still in service. The problem is the electronics and the electronic parts, particularly the electronic parts, are no longer manufactured. So uh, the suppliers have to go out, and they're, they're scrounging the universe trying to find electronic parts to put in these old equipment. And so that opened up a huge counterfeit market. Yeah, yep. we got those parts for you. Here they are, except either A, they're not real parts. <laughs> they're not the part that they're advertised to be. Or B, they've been reworked parts, which means they may have a very short shelf life because they've been, actually been pulled out of existing components, cleaned up, painted, whatever, put back in the market as new. So the counterfeit electronic components issue is really a big deal. And yes, these components have gotten into military equipment and aircraft. So think about that. Yeah. Counterfeit components in the planes that are flying around over your head. That's right. So that's <laughs> a tough issue, but it's yeah. good, important quality issue. So Ryan's yep. going to be investigating that. You can look forward to that here later in January. And all this year, we're going to be keeping our eye on the economic picture. That's yes. one thing that I'm going to be keeping my eye on very closely is, is uh, the, uh, the financial cliff negotiations, which just ended, I suppose, maybe. But <laughs> or, now we're... Or just starting, depending starting, on how you look you know, at it. Yeah. Coming up on the debt ceiling yeah. negotiations. But a lot of that affects what we do, uh, obviously. Uh, it affects the, the, credit rating, uh, uh, the credit ratings and, and the economic picture. And we're going to be keeping an eye on that. I, I personally think the economic picture is actually brightening. I think yeah. that there's a lot, of, a lot behind the scenes and certainly the... Uh, the employment figures look good. The unemployment figures are, are, are going down. Yep. Uh, certainly, it's a brightening picture. And we've, we've been seeing, as we've talked about, yep. manufacturing seems to be doing seems well. Seems to be doing so, better. The stock yep. market's doing well. So I think that yep. there's a lot of some cross root winds blowing here, but I think that ultimately we're going to be having a good year in 2013, and, and we're going to be keeping our eye on that. So that is our show for yep. this first Friday of the year. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dirk, for being here. I <laughs> yeah. appreciate that. Hey, you, you know, that's right. You too, man. Show. Glad and, you made it back. Yeah, that's right. You too. And, and we just uh, have to lose some weight so we don't break our next set of chairs. Yeah, that's right. This, these, these are solid. <laughs> all right. All right, well, thank you all for joining us. We're going to be back at you next Monday with another great week of QDD, and we'll be back next Friday with another QDL. That's right. So long. See you then. Bye.